Welcome everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started. I know we're a few minutes behind, but this is the time. These contestants are waiting so patiently over there. We don't want to do it any longer. So, yeah. I am Colleen Merrill. I am the Executive Director of the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. And my name is Jordan Owens. I'm the Director of the Health Resources Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> iPhones, Dropbox, Uber, Eat Street. These things weren't here 10 years ago. They were ideas. <laughs> they were ideas that somebody actually dreamed up and took the courage to bring to life. What you are going to witness tonight is nine young entrepreneurs, innovative thinkers, who are exploring what could be next, who visualize a product, a service, or a process that others don't see, a way to make their life easier solve a problem, or create value. They are going to stand here before you tonight and share their vision at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh's fourth annual Culver's Business Model Contest. So thank you for everybody coming here tonight and supporting the entrepreneurial spirit. I'm going to have Jordan give an overview of what you can expect tonight. Yes, so I'm going to quickly, very quickly go over the agenda. Um, we'll start with our welcome remarks and talking about ourselves for a while, and then we'll go into the contest overview so that everyone here understands how this is all going to go down, okay? And then you'll hear nine student presentations tonight. Nine students will come up and give their business model presentation, and then we'll pull up some of the entrepreneurs from the panel to do a little open Q&A session. You guys can all ask me any questions that you have, or we're tallying up the scorecard, and of course, we'll announce the winners. And then immediately after tonight's event, we're going to have a VIP guest reception for everyone that received one of these black VIP cards which will continue to pass out. Okay? As well as the contestants. That is right. Okay. So, um, we need to do some special thank yous. And our first thank you is for the Ulta Resources Center. I have to tell you that in 2014, Ulta Resources decided to support the entrepreneurial spirit here at UW Oshkosh. And what they have done is created a foundation for our center, and this center has literally touched thousands of lives. We are humbled and completely grateful for everything they have done for us. Round of applause for the all <laughs> And as you may have noticed, we're now calling this the Culver's Business Model Contest. And we're named after Craig for a lot of reasons. First is, many of you don't actually know this, but he actually graduated from UW Oshkosh. He came here, he graduated, and he went to some amazing things. Took me about six years. But more importantly, he truly, truly cares about the students. He's not only donated financial resources to make tonight possible, but he also donates his time year in and year out to help participate in these events and help inspire the next generation of young entrepreneurs. So, Craig, thank you so much for all your help. Let's give him a You know, they say it takes a village to raise a child. I would say that it takes a network of mentors to raise a business. The connections and the support that people have given us are amazing. And three of them are supporting our young entrepreneurs tonight with in-kind services. Kevin Eisman, John Dodinsky, and Dave Gerzak, who is here. So thank you very much for your support. <laughs> We have an amazing board of advisors, and like I said, it is because of these connections that our students are able to really launch their business, take it to the next level. So I thank all of our board of advisors for taking the time with our students, for advocating for entrepreneurship, and for truly opening doors that we would never be able to walk through without your support. So thank you to our board of advisors and all of our mentors. Is the Alta Resources Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Before I tell you that, I have to give you guys a little bit of perspective, okay? Like a million years ago when I was an undergrad student here, there was literally nothing on campus for student entrepreneurs. There was no center, there was no club, there was no major, no minor. If you were a student with the business ideas, you had nowhere to go. So back then, I thought, okay, Jordan, if you want to be an entrepreneur one day, why don't you start an entrepreneurship club and see how that goes? So I started an entrepreneurship club back in 2012, and students just couldn't get enough of it. I mean, it quickly became one of the largest clubs on campus. We had 40, 50, 60 plus students showing up for all of our meetings. And there was just all this excitement around entrepreneurship on campus. 
And Colleen saw all this excitement, and she knew if these students needed a resource to go to their business site. So she went out to the community, she found some amazing partners to help fund and start what is now the Ultra Resources Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. And we're here to help all of you. So any UW Oshkosh student, regardless of your major, or your minor, or your year here, or your credits, if you have a business idea, you can come to us, and we can help you get your businesses started and going. This is my little brother, he's gonna awkwardly walk up to the front and <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we can help you guys get your businesses started. And what we provide is one-on-one -on -one consulting. We provide access to mentors, to office space, to structured programs, and as you see tonight, funding for your business ideas. And we're not some cute little assistance program either. We are a force. Two years ago, we won a global award when we were named the Emerging Entrepreneurship Center in the world. A year and a half ago, we brought in Kevin Harrington for Shark Tank, and we held the first ever America's Pitch Tank contest. About well, six months ago, we helped bring in David John from Shark Tank, and we let our students and some local high school students pitch to him. And this year, we're creating a collaboration among universities to help grow the entrepreneurship ecosystem in our area. And if you have no idea what that means, that's okay. I'm just telling you, we have an awesome resource here that's free to all of you. So I strongly encourage you to take advantage of it, because I wish I had it when I was in your shoes. Sorry, I got a little intense there. All right, so. <laughs> So here are some of the many student businesses that we helped start. Um, in the last three years or so, we helped start about 29 student-run companies and helped them get about $300,000 in funding. So if you're sitting there, you're like, wow, this sounds really cool. How do I get involved? If you have a business idea, you want to reach out. My email address is in the brochure that you all have in front of you. You can reach out to me. And then listen up, because Colleen's going to tell you about two awesome programs we have coming up. Right. So our goal is really to empower and transform students here at the university. If you apply to our pitch contest, which we had about a month ago, or you apply to this business model contest and you were not selected, don't stop. So we really had a hard time, the judges had a hard time getting down to these nine finalists, but it doesn't mean there aren't resources for you and whatever it is that you're working on. So coming up, we still have our 12-week accelerator program. If you are interested in that, it closes on December 6th, so you can get your application in. And basically, we meet once a week, and we take you through the process of validating your business idea and deciding if it's a go or no go, if you should launch or if you shouldn't launch your business. And there is seed funding, $5,000 investment that goes to help you support the growth of your company. In addition, we have a summer incubator program. And really what that is all about is we take two of our accelerator teams, we give them $10,000 stipend to stay here during the summer instead of going home, and they work full time on learning or growing their business finding resources, we do mentor lunches weekly. Um, it's an awesome program if you're interested. On top of that, we are always available for one-on-one -on -one consulting, so it's not just these programs. We are here daily to work with you and connect you to the resources that you need. Okay, awesome. So we're gonna get into the contest breakdown here. So as I mentioned, you're gonna hear from nine student teams that are come up and give a four-minute business model presentation. And that's a hard cut off at four minutes. So Colleen is our timer, and she is offers to come up and tackle and drag anybody that goes off over the four minutes. And she's been saying that for a couple of years, so I'm kind of hoping somebody tries it today. But it's a four-minute cutoff. And then, after each presentation, immediately after, the judges have two minutes of Q&A with each contestant. And again, that's a hard cutoff at two minutes. I don't think you're going to run up there tackle them, but she might yell at you or yell at me. So just please, two minutes is what we're shaking for you. And we're doing that with a really tight timeline so that it's all fair to every single contestant so it can move you along really smoothly, okay? After all the presentations, the judges will fill out their scorecards and they will decide on their top three winners. And then they'll submit their scorecards and then those will all be tallied up. So we're doing it different than last year in the last few years. Usually we let the judges go in the hallway and they talk about it for like 45 minutes and we're all in here waiting. So what we're gonna try to do is just use the scorecards. We're gonna allow the judges to pick their top three winners and we're gonna tally it all up, okay? So what's up to grab tonight is $32,000 of cash and in-kind services, $32,000. So again, just to put it in perspective, five years ago when I was running the entrepreneurship club here, I did a business plan contest, and I required each contestant to do a 15-minute presentation on their entire business plan, and the grand prize was $100 that I called make my mom to go and make that kind of money. But you can guess it's not very well attended events, but we're doing a lot better now. So $32,000 is what's up for grabs here. First place get 15,000, second place 10,000, third place 7,000, and then you see the winning back the People's Choice Award 
That person doesn't get any money, but they get bragging rights because they're decided by all of you. Go to vote for the People's Choice Award winner. Get up on Twitter, tweet at OpenCDI, and you put the contestant's name with the hashtag UWOBMC. Okay? And only one vote per county. Okay. So let's meet our judges. Colleen, I'm going to introduce everyone on the left side of the screen. Now I'm going to introduce everyone with really hard to pronounce last name. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm going to start with Craig. Craig grew up in uh, South Prairie, South Prairie. South Prairie, Wisconsin, where he graduated high school and which is now home to the Culver's headquarters. He is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and he studied biology. After graduating, he went on to work at McDonald's as a manager, and during that time, he had an aha moment that ultimately led to the Culver's today. There are currently over 580. 600. There are currently over 600. It grows every time. It does <laughs> in the United States, and you are currently serving as CEO of Culver's. So thank you again for sponsoring our program and for being here tonight. Yep. Next up is Jason Sonor. Jason went to school at UW Oshkosh, where he graduated with a degree in MIS in marketing. He then went on to Marquette University, where he received his MBA in business and computer science. Jason is currently the president and CEO of Telcomet Inc., which is a publicly traded manufacturer of the patented green technology EcoSmart, intelligent energy management systems, and provider of the EthoStream, one of the largest high speed internet access providers in the world. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Wisconsin, which is what, 10 miles from here? About 10 miles. About 10 miles. It was in the Fox Cities that he began selling shoes for Shields. After graduation, he went to the University of Wisconsin Madison, where for one summer he worked as a car salesman. Yep. Good job. Becoming sales professional of the month that summer. Good. Soon after, with the help of his co-founder, Matt launched BadgerBytes.com in Madison, and it since has become Eat Street. Eat Street has now raised over $27 million. More than that? $40, 40 million. <laughs> and it's working with over 15,000 restaurants? You got it. Okay, nationwide. So please, a big round of applause. <laughs> Tom received his undergraduate degree from Yogi Oshkosh, and there he went to Notre Dame to pursue his MBA. He's a successful healthcare entrepreneur, trustee, consultant, and executive. Tom is the founder and current owner of Cardinal Points Group, a healthcare consulting and investment firm located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Next uh, our next up is David Swintowski. David holds a bachelor with double major in finance and accounting from UW Oshkosh where he played basketball. You don't know if you see him. He is a member of the Association for Corporate Growth, the Turnaround Management Association, the North Carolina Association of CPAs, and the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. He is currently the managing director of Dunning Capital, where he helps entrepreneurs finance, scale, and sell their company. Good up for David. <laughs> through the programs that we'll be scoring also. So this is something we're adding this year. So we are almost there. We are getting ready. So I just want to remind you that close to 40 student teams applied. They were reviewed and scored by a team of judges. And what you will see tonight are the nine finalists that rose to the top. Keep in mind that each one of these teams only found out nine days ago that they would be presenting tonight. Tonight, they have chosen to share their passion with you. Only three are going to walk away with passion prizes, but everyone should leave tonight proud that they stepped up to the plate. And as Mark Twain said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the things that you did. So, in order to respect all the time and their presentations, I ask that everyone take out their cell phones right now and turn them off or make sure they are on silent, okay? And when they are done, please, a big round of applause for each one of these teams that presents tonight. We are ready. Okay, first up, we have Mom, but don't take care. Let's come up here and get ready. Oh. Well, she's 
getting ready, all of the contestants, I want you to know there is a TV screen over there that has a timer for you. And the seconds will count down from five. When it gets to zero, you begin and you will see and be able to watch how much time you have left. Okay. Okay. Good evening. My name is Lydia Yang, and I am the owner of Freedom Care Center, a mom adult daycare center that fosters hope, compassion, and safety to the aging and disabled in our community. My vision is to enhance the quality of life and promote self worth to the aging and disabled in the Ashkash area. Five years ago, my dad had a stroke. In my family experienced firsthand the need for an adult daycare center with mom friendly services. With over 2,500 people, the mom are the largest Asian population in Winnebago County. At least 35% of them, between the ages of 21 through 64, are disabled. One third of the mom population are living below the federal poverty line. In a focus group study done on the mom elderly here in Wisconsin, we found that many of them felt isolated and alone during the day. Their best friend was the front window, waiting for someone to come home. Physical inactivity leads to depression, obesity, high mortality, and much more. Freedom Care Center will be a structured setting with organized activities to promote physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being. Culturally appropriate meals will be provided. Educational learning in the first native language will be offered, and transportation would also be provided. Freedom Care Center will be open to the community. However, my target group will be the mom ages 18 and older that are disabled, living here in Winnebago County. To get first-hand uh, to get first-hand knowledge, I have asked the aging and disabled in my local mom church of their interest. 90% of them were interested and stated that they would attend. 100% of them felt that this is a need, and at least, and every one of them knew at least one person who would be interested. To promote, I would inform local healthcare providers and distribute flyers in both Hmong and in English. I would advertise on the Hmong radio station, which is a source of news for the Hmong elderly. I would get support from local Hmong leaders to help spread the word, hold informational sessions, and also have open enrollment. My team will consist of two individuals, my sister and myself. We are both fluent in Hmong and in English. We will also be accepting volunteers and interns. I received my bachelor's here in UW Ashkash Human Services, and also a certificate in Community Health Studies. Next month, I will be graduating with a Master's in Transnational Human Services. I have eight years of experience working in the school district with small families, and also seven years of experience working in healthcare. My sister also graduated with a Bachelor's in Nursing here at UW Ashkash. She has over eight years of experience here um, as a registered nurse. Next month, she will be graduating with her Master's as a Nurse Practitioner. My advisor will be my uncle, Bua. He's the first individual to open the first small adult day center in the Twin Cities area. And he has over 15 years of ownership experience. It will cost an individual around $75 a day to attend, with the majority of my population being low income. They would qualify for Medicaid waivers. As soon as I secure a building, I will go through the process to get licensed by the state to receive waiver funding. The estimated startup would be around $40,000 at the least for the first six months and I would need at least eight participants a day to cover operating costs. Freedom Care Center will be the first of its kind in this area. So together, with your support, we can improve the quality of life for the aging and disabled in our community. Thank you. Um, they, they may cover um, some adult day center, but typically adult day care is not covered in, in the insurance. You need a building of some sort, correct? I sure do. Would we lose that space, or? Um, I'm still waiting the differences. Um, at the time, I'm you know, starting small, and so um, I have been looking more into leasing a building. Okay. 
So the, the people would stay overnight, they would live there, is that correct? No, actually um, this would be an office, it would be a center that's open Monday through Friday for six hours a day, for six hours a day. So it'd be 8.30 to 2.30. And $40,000 covers what? Um, so it's going to uh, cover the building cost and um, just to, to secure the place and any utilities that we set up and then to furnish it and also um, for the remainder because as soon as I get the building, um, I have to go through the licensing process and get um, all the insurance to come and make sure that I go to check out. And at the same time, I do have to um, go do more licensing in order to receive what you're to, to be in a proof of service. Yeah, licensing may be very difficult. Yeah, that's um, the good thing is the Department of Human Services they do have all of that information uh, listed on their website as to what standards I need to go through in order to be licensed. So I think it's a wonderful, wonderful idea. Thank you. You conducted a thorough twelve month analysis of financials. My concern is when you're operating a vehicle that's going to obtain the revenue. Fifteen hundred. That's how many people who have decided to join the revolution. What's the revolution? Tonight, we'd like to introduce to you University Hubs. Our goal is to provide access to students, alumni, and faculty to resources, campus services, all on a centralized platform. With categories such as ticket exchange and subleasing, just to name a few, we want to provide these services to all of our users. We also plan to work with companies such as Oshkosh Corp and Kimberly Clark to help with uh, relocation of students to participate in co-ops in my state. The University Hubs really prides itself on safety. Some of the key features are safe hubs, which are localized uh, public places where students can go and interact freely. We also require WISC mail or university mail in order to log into the system so it's completely secure. In terms of simplicity, we design a live news feed that updates its users' polls. Along with that, we've also designed categories or filters, for another word, where you can sift through irrelevant posts that you don't want to look at, and posts such as uh, date of the post, uh, price, are just a few of the examples. There are approximately 20.1 million college students in the United States today. That's a huge market, and it's projected to grow 14% through 2022. Our strategy is simple. Emphasize groundwork and social media. We'll have campus ambassadors on each campus, hosting launch parties with students, finding deals with local small businesses, and partnering up with student organizations. Social media is also very important. 98% of college-age students use social media daily. We plan on using Facebook ads, Twitter, Instagram, and even Snapchat to better engage with our market. And by the way, take a selfie with our Snap filter tonight. It takes a team to be successful. Brett and I will oversee the ambassadors and the operations of the team. Brett currently oversees 23 students, and I've overseen 73 students and over $448,000 in funding. Sohan and Rajan will oversee the web development with their experience with Amazon and Indeed.com. We'll also be overlooked by a board of advisors experience in financial management, web development, and information technology. University Hubs uses pay-per-click, subscription-based, and space advertising models in order to generate revenues. When we have traction, we're actually going to pivot to partnering with universities, which will in turn give us more revenue and more users. With the $15,000, we plan to invest in application development, website enhancements, company infrastructure, and furthering our marketing efforts. What makes University Hubs unique? 
is our flexibility. Apps like Classy and GiveTake are only offered on one university around the nation, and they only have a marketplace segment. We have the ability to pivot to a market based on the wants and needs of students and other cultures on college campuses. And being that we are college students, we're immersed in our market, and that gives us, gives us a very authentic approach to how we deal with those needs. And to be honest, being a college student, you feel like you're being pulled in 10 different directions. But the bottom line is that University Helps will be the only direction you're taking your business moving forward. No more cluttered emails, struggling to find sublease, or missing out on the big game simply because you don't have a ticket. Check us out on social media and sign up for an account today. Thank, Thank you. you. Like right here, like we can just throw another extra icon for like food or E Street and we can partner through there so then we can have sales to redirect it right through your phone. So you have a lot of things up there. How are you going to do textbooks, carpools, course notes, parking? Are you, are you planning on doing those things yourselves? A lot of things will be student sourced, just how, like, when if you wanted a certain company, so with the E Street deal, we'll know to pull those uh, companies from your site. So we can re redirect them with the deals on our site directly. Have you guys ever thought of other revenue streams? You said pay per click. Um, again, back to partnerships. It's you know, is there other revenue streams as you get more college students signed up besides pay per click that you think could be beneficial? Yes, yeah, so we have pay per click, and then we're doing subscription based, which would be local businesses sign up and they pay for like a certain level, so they can pay monthly, yearly, or for a specific post, and so that would be individually. And then we want to partner with universities so we can grab those users. How much can a market create? How much revenue? So we were piloted at uh, Wisconsin, we used to be called Wisco Hub, and so we don't have an exact number because we're still in the growth phase, so we, it would be hard to put like a value on that at the moment. Uh, Any Hi everyone, my name is Brenton and I want to pose a question to you tonight. Do you believe that the children are our future? If so, then I believe that you should know that one in five children live in poverty, and that poverty is the single greatest threat to a child's well-being and ability to learn. At the same time, we have millennials looking to spend their money on a more socially conscious brand than ever before. In fact, 75% of millennials say that social responsibility impacts their purchasing decisions. With 15 million children living in poverty that cannot afford new clothing, and 75.4 million people in a millennial age range looking to purchase a product to help with this problem, I believe that I found a solution to meet both of these needs. My solution is rethinking the graphic t-shirt. I'm introducing a clothing line that will produce clothing such as t-shirts, hoodies, and hats with inspirational posts and messages on them that will be fashionable and trendy. In addition, for every article sold, one item will be donated to a family that cannot afford new clothing. This means that you can buy an uplifting piece of clothing that not only 
looks great, but makes you feel great. We're introducing the Buy One, Give One model that Tom Shoes has done so well with for the inspirational graphic t-shirt market, offering my business and millennials an opportunity to give to children in need. Our business will function as an online store. Some of the ways that I will be able to donate are through schools, boys and girls clubs, and homeless shelters, to name a few. I also believe that soliciting feedback from my consumer will not only allow me to offer better services, but it will allow them to feel a connection to their purchase, to know where donations are being made, or to have suggestions or say so to where donations are being made. Innovating cutting edge designs, creating more customer delight, and making purchasing easier will gain consumer loyalty. I am the sole owner operator. I have five years of retail experience. I am a current business management major here at UW Oshkosh, and I'm a custom designer. Also, the screen printing company that I will be partnering with will be able to do fulfillment of the orders. I do also realize that this concept of this business is much bigger than myself, and when reality becomes bigger, I will need to seek outside assistance in areas such as accounting and marketing. Knowing that social media is the largest platform for me to reach my target market, I will be diligent in using this to target them by their likes, interests, and demographics. We will also grow through grassroots efforts, such as gaining press for our buy one, give one model. I will also seek out professional bloggers who I will ask to write about our business model, because if we can get this into the hands of the general public, there is no limits to the positive change we can make. My business will assume a cost of $8.42 per every shirt sold and donated. Each shirt will be sold at $20. So that leaves the business $12.58 profit. So even with our donations, we will make money. Our biggest competitive advantage is our brand. Yes, there are many other t-shirt companies, but we are the only t-shirt company with our Bible and Give One model and our design. We sell much more than clothes. We sell inspiration and give hope to less fortunate people. If you buy our clothing, you feel inspired wearing it. And know deep down that your attire is making a positive difference in the world. Dreamer City is where what you wear matters. Thank you. A lot of things that I looked at about Tom's shoes was that um, I really don't know their beginnings and their starts, but, but I would know that they, they don't give the same pair of shoes that you would purchase. They give a lesser pair of shoes. So if uh, you buy you know, a pair of dress shoes, they might not give the same quality of shoes. Where are the t-shirts made? Uh, the t-shirts will be uh, made, I will order them from a manufacturer and they will be sent to a screen printer. And then the screen printer will essentially hold the product there until the fulfillment. I guess my question is, are they made in the USA or are they made outside of the country? Uh, the shirt will be made outside of the country. You think that's a good thing? Or does it, does it matter? I believe that it matters, but in the same sense, uh, believing that it matters, I also believe that I should be able to donate to the children in need. I'm more or less thinking about what the children are doing. And I want it to be quality stuff. And I want what my consumer gets to be quality as well. And I had to find something that would be quality and as well uh, be pricey. The price needs to be in a, in a range where I can still have a business. Yeah, I understand. I love the idea of giving something away for a great cause. But for a brand new company, it's always difficult to be given I'll follow up with that. Have you gone out to the field uh, with that target market for poverty in this country and field tax focus groups? Have you gone out to certain segments? Just as such, your idea. I have not been able to get a chance to test out of uh, the demographics yet with the product. Yeah.
show of hands, how many of you guys have ever Googled things to do in Oshkosh? All right, many of us have. And these are the results for Oshkosh. They're not very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if these are representative of things to do in Oshkosh, does anyone want to go to a uh, Victorian early 1900s congressman's house? I don't think so. This is why I created Rate Adventure. I'm Evan Fryman, and Rate Adventure is an app that gives users everything there is to do in an area. What we mean by everything is the easy things to find, such as restaurants and attractions, plus events near you, exclusive deals, and and then some. Those things that are hard to categorize. For example, in Utah this summer, along a trail, I found a webbing bolted into an arch. And if you brought your own climbing supplies, you could repel to a new trail. Needless to say, I left my climbing supplies at home. How are you supposed to find these things? Great adventure. All right, so all these things are within two hours of Oshkosh. Um, Okay. I'm sorry. So, um, yeah, so Rate Adventure gives you all these things to do one at a time uh, based, on, based on reviews, uh, your preferences, and um, based on your reviews, preferences, and what you're looking to do. Okay, so our target market. I'm just gonna I'm gonna go through this, okay? No more categorical lists. We give these things to you one at a time based on your preferences and reviews. We surveyed 100 people, 80 of them said that when searching for fun things to do on the internet, they feel that they're not being provided the best options available. What separates us from our competition is that is exclusive deals. Uh, the distribution and comprehensive nature of our data, and for our competitors to adapt to our model, they would have to drastically improve their data uh, change, and change their existing market perspectives. Um, our target market is millennials, 75 million people in America alone, and we have two paths per bill. Uh, event goers and outdoor enthusiasts. Our plan is to target event goers first. Um, we plan to grow from city to city, and by targeting event goers, um, we will establish business relationships, a revenue stream, and actually be able to provide events and deals for our users. Um, so as we enter each city, uh, we will set up a lineup of opening um, deals and events, as well as host large events, uh, launch events. We will get users by um, we will get users by offering benefits to downloaders at these events or um, requiring the app for entry. So make the most out of your life. <laughs> Use Rate Adventure to plan your next adventure. <laughs> Who's getting all that information originally? Are you going to hire employees? Is that you going to be doing it? How are you going to get that original? 
Yeah, so um, it's going to be the team. So me, <laughs> it's going to be me, uh, interns, like social media people, mostly because we're going to cross uh, promote that kind of stuff on social media, kind of show the cool things in an area and the events going on and stuff. So uh, the team, the whole, not the whole team, but. Do you really understand uh, how people are going to know about your um, yeah, so we're going to market uh, large launch events, which I very struggled with today. Um, and we're going to, since it's like a fun and adventurous type of business, uh, we plan on having a strong social media presence and leveraging that as well as uh, these events and yeah. How do you make money? How? Uh, we make money from charging people to have these exclusive deals. There will be like one deal a day and one event a day in every region, like every day out for grabs. So we charge money for that. It will be free to add the events, but you can pay more to get it to larger audiences or to upload multiple at a time. And also uh, revenue from the large uh, launch events. Hello, I'm Austin Hips, and this is my brother Dust Hips. We're here to share peer tip information with you. FTI is a medical a medical reference system where healthcare professionals can access information stored in a central location. It is web based and mobile friendly, meaning you can access, access it from the Gulf or from your office. and I am passionate about providing my patients the best possible care. I'm searching this uh, particular website on the CDC. Right, uh, there's one specific piece of information I'm looking for, uh, and it has to do with the antiviral drug therapy for this. Uh, and here I found it, and um, I am uh, going to copy it off the uh, website. Then I'm going to go back to the to my FTI uh, program, save this uh, into uh, the FTI program, so that the next time I am uh, presented with this problem, I know there will be a next time, I will have immediate access to it, and I won't have to search uh, the internet for that information. The middle of 2014, Dr. Augustine approached me with this idea of the FTI. By late 2014, I was working. We continue to work on the system. Um, in the last summer, we wrote the database to make it more stable and provide a better user experience. Since the completion of the website, Dr. Augustin has used FTI daily and has added over 20 similar things. Medical error accounts for 250,000 deaths a year. This is followed by um, cancer and heart disease as the leading cause of death in the United States. Physicians will deal with multiple problems per day. Uh, the, the, the less common problems, they don't know how to exactly approach it. FDI is the solution to that problem because this will eliminate areas. They can simply look up the uh, solution to the problem that they have. FDI will target healthcare will target healthcare professionals through organizations and medical students. In exchange for feedback, we'll offer a free year uh, while the product is being developed. Once the product is developed, we will target physicians and organizations, starting with being clinics and organization that Dr. Rogers is one. Of the 1.2 million physicians in the United States, Dr. Dean Clinic has 500 physicians. Our team includes Mike Augustin, Austin Davis, and myself. Mike Augustin, he has 33 years of experience in the health industry. He is a, a group chair for family medicine, family medicine, and he is the organizational overview to help us uh, tap into the market. Austin Davis is a computer science major here at UWO, a lead programmer at Ohio. 
His technical skills helped us produce the first prototype. I'm a management and marketing major at Alpha Ivy University. I founded, uh, founded and president of Alpha Zeta Pi, and I will love the business side of FTI. FTI will offer a subscription based service with plans for organizations and individuals. Uh, goal is to provide an affordable solution with incentives to individuals, encouraging organizations to purchase plans to get a discounted price up to 50% off. To keep the startup cost low, I will do most of the development myself and also the remaining work to oversee. Um, the spend money we use to hire that freelancer and to prepay five years of hosting expenses. Each user generates $144 a year. This means we only need two users to remain profitable. Up until 100 users, we will be fine with that model. Once we reach 100 users, we need a, um, a dedicated server. A dedicated server costs $149 a year and it will help with the extra traffic. There are 25,000. 25,000 potential users in Wisconsin, which could lead to $3.6 million in profit. FTI is a solution that helps healthcare providers build a collection of information that saves their time and helps avoid medical care. Thank you. <laughs> very, very, very quickly, uh, tell me about this system. Is it real time for the providers? And number two, follow up real quick. A lot of data out there. There's 1.5 million medical terms alone. Tell me how you're accessing that data because you mentioned the doctor. And kind of tell me about real time in the field of the system. Um, it's, we got to think of it as like a medical textbook that's created by the user, organized by the user, and updated and maintained by the user. Uh, all the information that they keep in there is information relevant to them, not relevant to anybody else. So they're building this collection of resources that's available to them at all times. Um, and they keep up to date as medical advances are made. So I kind of stumbled on that, but like it's something they don't usually see, and they see maybe like once a year and they want to access it quickly, that's something they'll put in there, not just kind of old, but it's something where they don't want to miss out on it, but they need to access it quickly. To actually add on to that question from a technical aspect, uh, we've been going in my own to work there as well. Oh, that's good. Um, can you work around a lot of the data and set it into, you're actually recording the data in your own database, right? Correct. Sure. Have you ever thought of actually just making bookmarks to the data or recording where the data is stored? Because the problem is all of that health data, they updates over time and logs with the treatments for patients. So if you're going to run into this failure in the data, I'm curious what are you going to um, That would be up to the physicians or, and the users of the program to kind of keep that current information. In the future, we want to uh, tie it into organizations where they can have kind of like a leader who can have that information and everybody can kind of pull a fork off of that. Um, that makes sense. Uh, what about data security and data backup of, um, uh, you know, how technical that would be working on? Uh, we're starting with Dreamhost, which is a common hosting provider. Uh, in the future, with proper funds, we've got here on servers, uh, daily backups, and the good setup. My name is Paul Slatt. I'm the owner and operator of Walt Bean Farms. In 2013 and 2015, the USDA did a census on, and on national farm school programs. What they found is that spending actually increased by almost 105%. 42% of the nation's schools participate in the national farm school program. Wisconsin alone spent nearly $9.2 million on local fruits, vegetables, beef, the number one perceived barrier for Wisconsin Farm School programs is the inability to acquire consistent 
large quantities of produce. Farmers don't want to commit to schools that aren't willing to promise them or guarantee them business, and schools don't want to work with farmers unless they can actually provide the quantity and the consistency that they desire. We of all bean farms are growers of the highest quality produce, supporting Wisconsin farm school programs, and supporting, well, while supporting and educating communities to sustainable agricultural practices. Our mission is to increase fruit and vegetable availability for Wisconsin farm school programs and become their largest local supplier. As we grow, we intend to provide employment opportunities for individuals with intellectual and physical disabilities, empowering them through, excuse me, empowering them through supportive employment opportunities so that they can become active members within their communities. We have been fortunate to have some very good advisors, great advisors, and I'm humbled by their generosity. Without these individuals, we would, not be as so, we would not be so close to achieving our goals as we are today. What's a Wallapini? Well, Wallapini is actually, uh, in the IMR language, it actually stands for a uh, place of warmth. It actually refers to a rudimentary structure that's partially buried in the ground and actually utilizes the Earth's geothermal heat to allow them to grow fruits and vegetables 12 months out of year in extremely harsh climates. In these, inside the structures, we can produce honey, lettuces, herbs, berries, tomatoes, mushrooms, and more. Of our four nearest competitors, none have the ability to provide Wisconsin Farm School programs with the, with the produce consistency and the volume that they require. It's because of this deficit that schools become reliant upon these individual national food service distributors. Our company website will be designed by United Business out of Columbia, Missouri. We have been currently working with Feeding America um, to will be providing our wholesale distribution as well as providing access to their online food hub. As a veteran-owned business, we also carry the Home Grow My Heroes label courtesy of the Farmer Veteran Coalition. That will be on all of our products. But based on a 30 foot by 100 foot wall beam, with these numbers, we can pay for not only the entire cost of the product, but we can actually generate up to $20,000 per structure per year. We are committed to growing Wisconsin Farm School programs. And with your help this evening, we can make that possible. Thank you. So what I've been doing so far, sir, is uh, I've been working with Feeding America to get the numbers and working with AmeriCorps right now to find out what exactly schools are having difficulty achieving or getting, I should say. And a lot of them are berries, um, as well as tomatoes, especially in the, uh, the winter months. So to answer your question, I would say that we're looking to distribute through them. Do they have transportation? Yes, so a lot of the trucks right now for being American are coming back empty. And so what we've discussed is they're looking to fill those trucks on the way back. So let's say, for instance, they, they head down towards Milwaukee or Bonilac, even, they have to have a place to uh, pick something back up on the way home so they actually have a full truck. To come back with an empty load is a waste of money for them. But there's a cost to it for you. Yes, sir. Um, and that's one of those things I'll have to negotiate with them once um, that come, the time comes. We actually have a product. Do you have one of these structures now? No, sir. Are you in business now? No, sir, I'm not. Okay. Um, currently, I've been, uh, the past few years, I've been high time growing, and that's one of the things that we're going to incorporate within this. Mm -hmm. But as for now, I have a structure. With uh, Winnebago County, I've actually been able to secure two houses for my facility, or for my land, whenever I purchased it. That actually goes to my question. You're talking about sourcing labor, things being put into these tables. Yes, sir. So, Curious as to where you're actually going to locate the facility. Typically, you have to be 
that are probably going to uh, get related to the facilities themselves. Yes, sir. Um, so I'll have to work on the actual um, transportation of those individuals because they don't have it, for instance. However, as we continue to grow, we're going to kind of move closer to the school districts that we're actually supporting so that the, also the purpose doesn't have to travel in half a day or it's getting cut today and it's being delivered this morning on this afternoon. Thank you.
expect the school to buy this every single year um, for each kid? So they can decorate um, how the like drawing on it and everything. And um, my concern was that they wouldn't want to buy them every single year. After talking to a principal, she was just concerned that they would last one year, which they will. And so they're confident that they can do this every single year. Are there other competitors in this market segment? So there are, but they're on the another planet as far as price point. There are thousands of dollars for these large standing desks. So it's obviously very hard to scale that across school districts. Most school districts can't even afford that. There is no one doing boxes? Correct. What do elementary teachers say about it? Elementary teachers are very excited about it. They, there's a lot of research that shows that movement in the classroom improves behavior, improves test score, improves learning, everything. So they're 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 pumped for it. And the city is a frozen top of every existing desk for Correct. Now you said that I mean, every kid is a little bit different in length. So how are you going to overcome that? So on the bottom of the desk are perforations that allow. Uh, Students and probably with help from the teachers cutting and, and ripping for their their uh, perfect height size. Did you bring one with? I did not. We are not a production yet, but but your shirt will last a year. So uh, that, <laughs> they're, they're super durable. I have I have one. I have a very large one myself, and it can hold like 300 pounds of pressure. And I beat up on it with a monitor and I have a laptop, so it's, it's lasted me about a, a year and a half so far. So we'll see if a uh, Five year olds, but you're teachers would like your kids to sit down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can you adjust, can you adjust the height of anything? So the, the tall height will be the tallest for the students in the fifth grade. Thank you. Upgrade with the 
gain positive access and no advertising. By year two, we plan on expanding neighboring states and to grow from there on. By year one, we plan to have a net worth of 224,000 that have 100,000 people downloading my app with the upgrade. I have received support from Zach Kowalski to help me develop my logo. Also from Nancy and Stell from the Office of Business Administration in the Capitol. Ever since I came across the fact that 80% of Americans say they don't trust their government, I knew I had to solve this problem. The reason so many Americans don't trust their government is they don't know what's going on. My app, In Our Hands, is the only mobile app that's pushing out draft legislation, allowing people to come to the legislation, giving you power in this process. So please, help me with the power back in our hands. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming today. I'm going to start you off with a quote. Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Something's happening here. Our key markets are moving ATVs, ATVs, and snowmobiles with jet skis the most. As you can see in the picture, as you can see in the picture of ATV rentals in Wisconsin, there's huge gaps all throughout the state that can leave people walking or driving 45 plus miles to get to the closest run business. It's very similar with all of the other markets that I want to enter. URIDE is an online peer to peer business model where individuals can gain access to these resources based on their geographic location. It also allows individuals who own these resources to be able to make money by renting them out to those who don't. It saves our end user 20 to 30% on average. We're going to market through social media marketing, SEO, and word of mouth. Customer number one, John, he's 26 years old and he recently 
lot of boat, you start starting to realize that, like most boat owners, you don't use it as much as you hope to. Jane, freshman number two, she's a recent college grad. And she just she's planning a college getaway with her and her friends up at her parents' cabin. She wants to get out on the boat for a day on the water. So she goes online, finds your searches, rentals in the area, and you and pops up. She finds John's boat was five minutes after the cabin, 15 minutes closer than the local rental market or the business. It was a win win for both of them. John made money while he wasn't using his boat, and it was more convenient and cheaper for Jane. These are our projected startup costs. As you can see, our fixed costs are relatively low, and our variable costs obviously we know they'll go up as we scale in size. The nice part about that is as we start getting traction going through our website, our revenues will be able to cover our costs. For easy math, we'll say that John rented out his boat for $100. We're going to collect 5% in the listing commission from John and 5% in service charges from Jane, resulting in 10% revenue. John will walk away with $75 to $90, depending on his insurance package that he chooses. Outdoorsy is a similar business model that connects individuals to RVs that other people may own. In their first 22 months, they've taken 3% of the market in RV rentals and had 270,000 tra transactions go through the website. Obviously, with outdoor recreational vehicles, we have a much larger uh, market. And so if we just get one-tenth of a percent to go through us, that would be 13 million in, re in uh, revenue and 1.3 million in profit. Our competitive business analysis is the fact that since we're a peer-to-peer -peer business model, we don't have the geographic restriction that you see with most traditional rental businesses. Also, since we don't have, we don't actually own the rentals, it gives us a relatively low operational cost, which we then pass on the savings to the end user. My name is Michael. I'm a senior here, marketing major with an emphasis in sales. Michael, um, co-founder is Chris. He's a computer science major with experience and worked on large-scale applications. He's currently developing a website and app, which will go live in March of next year. We've chosen these three mentors because. John Debbies is an expert in marketing. Pat Gebel is, is the CEO of a publicly traded tech company that he started from the ground up. And John Karras has 15 plus years of business development, or global business development. When Spring Fever comes around, you ride is there for you. It's very fun. Do you have a repair and maintenance program yet? Uh, no. For damage to uh, equipment? <laughs> if not, I'd like to apply. That's why I could be the lawyer. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> it could be considered that for a revenue model. Um, no, because since I don't know where they're going to be, they could be anywhere. Um, at least I hope they're everywhere. They would just be through local contractors. And we would have to have service. Um, every six months, you've got to get in service. So make sure the vehicle is in good shape. All right, so let's give all the contestants one more huge round of applause. So, what's going to happen next is the judges will all fill up their.
third floor problems. They're going to put down their first, second, and third place winners, which doesn't have to be based just on the score. It can also be based on gut feeling. And they'll submit things to Dan right here, and he'll take them to another room to help another person to count them all out, and we'll decide the winners. So right now is your last opportunity to make a vote for the People's Choice Awards. If you want to jump on Twitter, tweet your favorite at UltraCEI, and use the hashtag UWOBMC. Once all the, the um, entrepreneurs are up here for the panel, that's when all the, the voting stops. Okay? Okay. Okay. okay? And you guys can really ask me too.
Craig Culver, uh, I think it's been set up there, but we started uh, Culver's in 1984. Um, on December 5th, we're going to open eight restaurants on that day, and that'll take us to 604 restaurants. So some, something's just happened in, in our business, so uh, I guess, uh, what is it, four weeks ago or five weeks ago, our, our CEO uh, passed away. Bill Kaiser is his name, great guy. Been with me for 20 years, and I'm just 
We believe he had a heart attack and died instantly. But, so I, I'm back in as the CEO of our company again for a short period of time. Uh, the next CEO, we've already, uh, we've already picked that person. He's also been with us uh, for 20 years and uh, he will be outstanding. But he comes from uh, the financial world versus the operations world. And Bill and I both come from operations. So it's going to be a little different take uh, with our company, but he's got the culture, and that's that's what we're so excited about. So great to be here today. Matt Howard from Beat Street. We started Beat Street about seven years ago now, so back in 2009. I was a junior at the University of Wisconsin when I got the idea. I think the coolest thing is um, I'm really happy to be here tonight because uh, what really pushed Beat Street back in the early days was that we won a business competition very similar to this. Um, that was put on by UW. Our top prize was only $10,000, so I'm a little bitter about that. Um, but we got $10,000 of free office, and that really helped me with expansion. I've been full-time with my company since the day I graduated college in 2011. We now have 150 employees um, in Madison. We're based in Madison. Just moved into our brand new office that we built out over the last year. We've raised $40 million in financing, which has allowed us to continue to expand the company very, very fast across the United States. We are located in 250 cities across the country uh, with about 15,000 restaurants. But I'm very happy to say that Oshkosh was our third market because I'm from the area. So this was one of our very first. And the reason I started this market was because I lived with my parents when I started it. So <laughs> the summer uh, after I graduated college, I came to uh, right up here to, to UWO. So I'm really, really happy to be here. It is still one of our best markets in the country. What is the best market? Madison is the best market because it's been around the longest, uh, but Oshkosh was actually one of the fastest growing. I think it was the second fastest growing we've ever had. How much does Culver's do? Uh, Culver's is a very little business right now, but that is going to change. I've heard, I've heard uh, that the current CEO really likes Eat Street and he's going to sign up uh, for Eat Street, but we're going to work on that tonight. So, <laughs> talk to Craig. We're going to He mentored me way years and years ago and gave me some awesome advice. So it's great to, to be on a panel with them. I don't think I'm worthy, but thank you. <laughs> so I've got a long story here. I'm going to try to keep it really short. The strange thing is I actually know Matt very well because my business that I started and I sold in 2007 to the company I now run, we actually do business with Matt as well. Um, later the board asked me to take over on my company. So um, since that time, while we still operate Delta Net, it is one of the largest networks in the US. I also started a uh, IoT or Internet of Things business. It's the second division of our company called EcoSmart. We build intelligent thermostats, wall outlets and light switches that all talk over wireless and taking technologies and are controlled over a website, over a cell phone, or simply by walking into the room. So that's what I do. Awesome, thank you. So we have three awesome entrepreneurs up here that are willing to answer any questions and reasons that you guys have. So who has a question they want to ask any of this? I'm willing anyone, otherwise I have a list. I can go to my list, but I want you guys. Okay, Leah? What are some key characteristics you think are required for a home? I'll say it's one of the developers over time. Uh, I see a lot of drive in people when they walk into the There's a young lady who did a presentation on in, in our hands. You can walk in front of the crowd and talk with a, a lot of, a lot of uh, energy and a lot of belief in what you do. That's what an investor is going to respond to. That's what a customer is going to respond to. Drivers are probably the most important people. Without a doubt, you're going to be hitting obstacles nonstop. And I think there's so many times that through the course of building my company, I could have just quit and that would the probably the easier option. Um, so you really have to have that drive. You can never lose that drive because when you do lose it, you're going to hit the next obstacle and you're just going to stay what you've done. Um, so you've got to have the passion. You have to have, you know, for me, um, what really drove me through the years was building my team. Um, I'm so proud of the team that I built at Eat Street. They're, my first employees were my friends. And today, every time I hire a new person, it's someone who can be part of our culture. And, and really, um, it's, it's just something that drives me every single day, developing that team. So you've got to find what, what keeps you going because you're going to hit so many obstacles along the way um, that you have to keep that passion. That team is part of, like you talked about, and I am. I don't think part of it is the ego thing, my PTO and stuff like that. So when you find your friends, you want to make sure that you're going to do it. And, you know, I'll 
same thing they're saying. Uh, but you're, you are going to have challenges. You're going to make mistakes. And uh, some of those challenges, you're going to have a tough time getting past. And what do you do? If you believe in what you're doing, if you really believe and have a passion for what you're doing, you'll find a way to overcome those challenges. And you'll overcome the mistakes that you make along the way. But as well as team, surround yourself. Surround yourself with people that you know that really feel like you do. That really believe in what they're doing as well. People that uh, make a difference. People that uh, do the right thing. Set the right example for the other people around you as well. Simple thing. You know, it sounds so simple. It isn't that simple. But if you really love what you're doing, you'll find a way. I'm going to carry on the answer just one step further. Matt mentioned you started your business off in a business like competition. Believe it or not, I started the first thing. Dollars to me again. I'm a little bit different right now, but um, the reason that I bring that up is when we talk about finding the right people, finding the right resources is incredibly important as well. We didn't have to go to the resources center here in Oshkosh when I was here, or in Madison. We didn't have a lot of investors here in the Midwest. There's an enormous amount of resources that are available for crafts today that Lord knows I wish were available back when we were trying to do our business across the town. So find those resources, make use of those resources. They're available, and you've got people like Colleen and Jordan here to help you. They're the best thing you've got going for you. That's fun. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you know, you guys found a game from the head that I hope is relevant to this. Uh, it's called the game financially. Is that what you're. Oh, we were all just real wealthy. It's always been humble. <laughs> Start or did you have a lot of financial back? I can tell you I paid for my Oshkosh uh, tuition by working in a fair nurse through my summer while I was going to school. And I can carry the story one step further. These guys already know what they care about them, but my kids go to Oshkosh. My son graduated yeah, last year, my daughter's graduated from the nurse, nursing program in May of this year, and my youngest is starting in Oshkosh next year. And all three of them get the first half of every year. I, I think uh, sometimes a lot of people think it takes a lot to start a business. Yeah. I put a thousand dollars in my which was a lot of money. Which was, <laughs> that, that was, that was that three bad. months of rent, and I don't know how I, I can ask the rent more expensive. Um, but but that that got us to where we, you know, to, got us going. We, before I raised my first investment capital, like from an investor, uh, we had already made $100,000 in revenue. Um, so that $1,000 was turned into $100,000 from sheer just focus and dedication. I didn't pay myself. I sold as, as the, I was doing. I sold running shoes in high school and college. I sold cars for a summer. That was so I could afford to go to college and then simultaneously put $1,000 into my own company. Now we've raised $40 million. It's a little bit easier, but it was not easy in the early days uh, because it took, it took years uh, to be able to start the product with $1,000. So winning $15,000 was far more than I, than I had in the beginning. You know, when we started calling for this in 1984, I had been in the restaurant. It took us until the third year to make the first buy at the business. So the story I tell all of our operators, all of our managers, is just because you put that sign up there doesn't guarantee you anything. You've got to work at it every single day and get going. And you've got to earn the business. You've heard that on advertising on different different type signs. But you really have to earn it every single day. You know, we don't want to put the tools on the side. I remember the first tax account from how you said earlier. That did my first buy. When I started the business, I did come from humble beginnings that we talk about. You had to take a risk. You need to put yourself out there. I was married and had my first kid when I started that company. The first thing that I thought was, I'm not going to regret 30 years from now not trying this. When I was at that age, you can fail and move on from it. But when you try to do it at the age of 50 or 60, it doesn't come so easy anymore. You're never going to regret Wait a 
this thing. <laughs>
photo shoot right here. We're going to ask all the contestants to come down and take a quick picture with all of our judges. And then we'll let everyone else disperse and come in that person's talk to everyone. Okay, so the contestants can come down really quickly. They all did a great job. Yeah. Alright, contestants, the last thing to come over here, line up for the photo shoot. Yep. In a big pot, get right in front of Craig. Come up to the front of Craig. How many come to the group? Get quick to the front. Turn the key, turn the key. Alright, I can't. You guys come to the front of the desk. <laughs> Judges do, we have to come forward. Get him on Breathe in. Breathe in. <laughs> no, the count of three, you gotta say like a box. One, two, three. Butterburger! <laughs> <laughs> 